An adage borrowed by the Nazis stated, if a lie is repeated often enough, people will tell it's the truth. In the art of propaganda and propaganda psychology, just keep repeating something as if it was a fait accompli, an established fact, and a substantial percentage of the general population will come to believe it. The advertising industry understands this, so do government propagandists, so do revisionist historians. Just keep telling the lie often enough and people will believe it's true. This, however, does not make it true. It has never made it true and it never can. It's only the historical merits, the veracity of something, which determines its truth or its falsehood. We've been told repeatedly in much of international media, certainly in left-wing academia, and even now among certain evangelical Christians and even left-wing Jews, that Israel is guilty of an occupation, an occupation of Palestine and Palestinian territory. This is the claim, and we hear it repeatedly. We are often told this is substantiated by a violation of UN resolutions, the United Nations. Quite a thing. Why do we not see the United Nations speaking about Chinese occupation of Tibetan territory? or Arab occupation of the territory of the Berbers of North Africa, or the Turkish occupation of Kurdish territory. Israel is always somehow singled out, with one exception. There is indeed a Chinese occupation of a national Tibet. There is indeed an Arab occupation of what had historically and traditionally been Berber homelands from Morocco all the way across the north of Africa. Tunisia, Algeria. However, archaeology tells us something concerning the West Bank, concerning Jerusalem, concerning Judea, Samaria, concerning cities today called Nablus, Bethlehem, etc. The archaeological record substantiates that the indigenous people are Israelites. The biblical record tells us in the patriarchal narratives in the book of Genesis, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in that land as long as the Canaanites. The earliest civilization is Canaanitic and Israelite, or certainly Hebrew, Hebraic peoples. This is verified by archeology. span One can go to any tell with multiple strata of archeological excavations showing each successive period going back in time. The indigenous people are always what today we would popularly call the Jews. Nobody would ever say, nobody would postulate something as absurd as that the Maoris are occupying New Zealand, or that the Apaches occupy Arizona, or that Eskimos occupy Greenland. I don't object to Pakia, New Zealanders of European or Anglo-European descent living in New Zealand. But don't try to tell anyone Maoris have no right to be here as the indigenous people that they're an occupying presence. I have no problem with Euro-Americans, with Asian-Americans, with Afro-Americans or Hispanic Americans living in Arizona. I have no problem whatsoever. But please don't attempt to postulate that Apaches are an occupying presence and have no right to be there. By definition, an indigenous people cannot be called an occupying presence. They were there first. The first historical and anthropological claims to the land is to the indigenous population in every case. However, the United Nations and others expect us to make an exception for the Jews. Unless the indigenous population is Jewish, the law applies. When it's a Jew, we make an exception. They're an occupier. Can a Maori occupy New Zealand? Can an Apache occupy Arizona? Can an Irishman occupy County Tipperary? Well, the answer is obviously no for an obvious reason, and it is just as obvious that a Jew cannot occupy Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nablus. The claim has been made that the assertions by certain evangelical Christians of a premillennial dispensational perspective and others, and by 
certain Jews of various theological persuasions are based on biblical claims or claims based on the Judeo-Christian scripture to Israel being a Jewish homeland. That is very true. However, I speaking to you as a believer in Jesus, my faith is Judeo-Christian, I do not need to resort to my personal faith to substantiate that conviction, even though it is my conviction. I have archaeology. It is purely Islam that can only base its claims on a religious pretense. Islam divides the entire world into Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb, the world of Islam and the world of the sword. Islam traditionally spread by jihad, by military wars. Muhammad personally led 27 military campaigns. The reason the Berbers live under Arab occupation is because of jihad. The reason Islam has extended itself into multiple nations, including Iran, is because of jihad. Islam teaches that once Muslims have conquered a land, it is theirs by the divine right of their God, Allah, that it is given to them by Allah, and it is now part of Dar al-Islam. They can only base their demand on religion, demanding that Jews, Christians, and others acquiesce to the teaching of the Koran. Now, in actual fact, the Hebrew scriptures say that God bequeathed that land, which is his land, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. In the New Testament, Jesus stated quite clearly, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 24. Using the Greek terms, pretheron and ethnon, until Gentiles. At the end of Matthew 23, in the technical preface to the Olivet Discourse that follows in chapter 24, Jesus made it clear the Jews must be back in Israel and in Jerusalem specifically to herald his return, saying, Baruch haba b'shem Odenai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from the Hebrew Hallel Rabbah liturgy from Psalm 113 to 118. Jesus said that directly. The Jews must be there. They must return. People ignore this. So-called scholars like Gary Burge circumvent it. Others, like Philip Church, simply ignore it and expect others to ignore the plain teaching of Jesus and of the Hebrew Scriptures. But once again, I do not even need to resort to the teaching of Jesus as much as I believe it, or to that of the Hebrew prophets as much as I believe it. The idea that the United Nations of all organizations carries a moral credibility to determine what is an occupation, when that pronouncement is highly selective, when simply because of political considerations they ignore the plight of the Tibetans, when they ignore the plight of Africans being massacred in Darfur by radical Islam, when they ignore the plight of many people suffering under Islam and other regimes, but select Israel and state it as if it's a fact when archaeology and history debunk it as a false claim is absurd. The United Nations, noted for its corruption and inefficiency. Oil for food, food for oil. We saw the wasted inefficiency, the misallocation, misappropriation. We saw what happened with the scandals, the payoffs, the kickbacks. In my native New York, I lived directly across the street from the United Nations. I recall looking at the limousines with diplomatic license plates and diplomatic seals of ambassadors to the UN from third world nations with astronomical infant mortality, with unspeakable poverty and injustice, with reserved parking spaces simply for UN diplomats, people from these impoverished countries with elaborate limousines, Rolls Royce, Cadillac, Lincoln Continental, Mercedes Benz, living like kings in Manhattan, living like the salubrious aristocracy they are at the expense of their own people who live in subhuman poverty. And then these same diplomats from the third world 
will convene inside the UN and pronounce resolutions, biased resolutions against Israel. When you have UN human rights commissions and disarmament commissions composed of nations guilty of the most atrocious human rights violations the modern world has witnessed. When you have countries that have ranged from Libya under Gaddafi to China, when you've had countries ruled by dictators, arms traders, supporters of terror on human rights commissions, passing resolutions, we're supposed to accord the UN some moral credibility. Why not accord moral credibility to organized crime? Why not accord moral credibility to gangsters, to criminals? Because that's what most of these regimes passing these resolutions in fact are. It's absurd to accord or attribute any moral credibility to an organization that has been as fundamentally corrupt and mismanaged as the United Nations. But for that organization to selectively declare occupation in defiance of the hard archaeological and historical evidence that no one can challenge, while turning its back on the real occupations that take place throughout the world, goes beyond hypocrisy. But for people claiming to be Christians, to subscribe to this hypocrisy, for people like Stephen Sizer in the UK, or Philip Church in New Zealand, or Gary Burge in the USA, to lend credence to obvious absurdity, is well beyond the pale. Let's face the facts. An indigenous people cannot be an occupying presence. They were there first. The actual fact of the matter is that there were Jewish communities throughout the West Bank and in Gaza till the 1920s. They were destroyed in Islamic pogroms. The so-called Israeli settlements are restorations of the Jewish communities that had been there that Islam obliterated. They are the indigenous people. They reconquered that land not in an act of aggression, but in self-defense in a war they did not want. The only thing Israel has been guilty of is withstanding the scourge of radical Islam and jihad. These same people in the Western world are going to reap it themselves. In fact, the Hebrew prophet Obadiah in verse 15 says this, find me a single nation that has allowed Islamic immigration that has not had the plague of riots and terror. From the Bandler riots in Paris going on week after week, to the riots in Sydney, Australia, to the Bradford riots in England, to the September 11th attacks in the United States, this is only a hint of what the Israelis have had to face daily year after year after year. That same curse that the Israelis respond to in self-defense is now a curse that has come to the shores of Europe and America. It is time to wake up. No, I am not against Arabs. Arab Christians are my brethren. But look at the plight of Arab Christians. Look at what happens to Christians in Arab countries. Gary Burge does not talk about this, either does Mr. Church or Stephen Sizer. 3.4 million Christians murdered by Islam in Darfur and Sudan in 14 years. 3.4 million. Upwards of 98%, 98% of the evangelical pastors in Iran have been martyred. While the Saudi Arabian government funds the construction of mosques and Islamic institutions all over the Western world, including America, Australia, Britain, Europe, you cannot build one church in Saudi Arabia. You cannot even bring a New Testament into that country. They cannot show you a single Islamic nation, not one, that will give Jews and Christians the rights Muslims have in Israel 
or in America, or in New Zealand, or in Britain, or in any Western democracy. It is absurd. It is ridiculous. There are two standards. Come, debate me, Gary Burge. Debate me, Philip Church. Debate me, Stephen Sizer. You agreed to debate me on TV in Great Britain, Mr. Sizer, and then you back down. Come, debate me. You can bring your propaganda. I will bring irrefutable facts, certainly from scripture, but also from archaeology and from history. Things I challenge you to challenge.